robbing, torture, possess nuns, and a satanic Sabbath. Benjamin Christensen's legendary film uses a series of dramatic vignettes to explore the scientific hypothesis that the witches of the Middle Ages suffered the same hysteria as turn-of-the-century psychiatric patients. But the film itself is far from serious. Instead, it's a witch's brew of the scary, gross, and darkly humorous. Happy Halloween, everybody. Good evening. This is Stone Gas Man, live from New York City. And we are here to do a 100th anniversary audio commentary for writer, producer, director Benjamin Christensen's silent horror classic, Haxon also known as Haxon Witchcraft Through the Ages. And uh, I'm very excited to be doing this commentary uh, with all of you. Uh, even though I wasn't able to quite listen to all the extras on the Criterion channel in preparation for this, because I was too busy working on Don't Torture a Duckling, but uh, and we just finished that commentary. Check that out on my channel. Uh, but... Um, yeah, so uh, Hexen is one of the most important silent films. I mean, truly, it um, it's my favorite silent horror, even eclipsing Nosferatu, which I also did a commentary on earlier in the year. Uh, and I've seen Nosferatu many times, and the uh, images from uh, Nosferatu are indelible. But Hexen has a lot of those uh, same scary images. And uh, luckily, uh, even, Don't Torture a Duckling, honestly enough, didn't really get much coverage at all for its 50th anniversary. There is a lot of uh, articles been written this year about Haxon and the 100th uh, anniversary. And I think that, uh, I think watching it today, I think we all, uh, it, it will all make us all think and, and uh, that, wow, we need to be careful when it comes to uh, letting hysteria run rampant and let people go out of control, you know, and people get hurt and eventually get killed all uh, out of, uh, just superstition and lies, and uh, it's uh, insane. But the history covered in this film, and it blurs the line between fact and fiction, as you'll soon find out. But uh, at any rate, I think we're ready to get started here. Any, uh, I thank you all for joining me tonight for this Axon commentary. So why don't we go get go ahead and get started. So I'm out of three. I'm paused on the Criterion logo for... Haxon, three, two, one, and play. Janus Films. Yep. Haxon. This is the uh, 2016 restoration. It's a uh, third of uh, three, uh, basically the third restoration it's gotten in the last 20 years. This movie is so legendary. It's the perfect film for Halloween. Oh, I agree. Uh, believe me, I absolutely agree. A culture on historical presentation in movie pictures in seven parts. Yeah, Benjamin Christensen wrote the script and produced this film. Between the years 1919 and 1921, he worked on this movie for two years. For the photography, I am grateful to Mr. Johan and to Mr. Richard Lau uh, for, and for the art direction. My main sources are mentioned in the theater's program. Yes. Let us look into the history of uh, mysticism and try to explain the mysterious chapter known as the witch. And automatic, and uh, as we start uh, chapter one, we start with a series of illustrations. The belief in sorcery and witchcraft, probably as old as mankind itself. And uh, so here again, we have uh, we have basically what's almost presented like a historical lecture or an essay. Uh, I mean, there have been so many interpretations of this movie over the years, but uh, it's a really a wild combination of uh, uh, fact and fiction, and uh, and also you know just literally about it, almost the, the history of witchcraft and what 
women went through during the Middle Ages in terms of being tortured, in terms of being hunted down. Uh, you know, here again, the uh, shows us pictures of evil spirits. And uh, like I said, this is a this is a result of two years of work, and you will definitely see. You know, there's some jaw dropping stuff in this movie. It's absolutely uh, insane. Well ahead of its time. Well ahead of its time. <laughs> the belief in evil spirits, sorcery, and witchcraft is the result of naive notions about the mystery of the universe. Yes. Look at that. That is so illuminating. So if we're going to start talking about Haxon, we need to talk about the uh, Haxon's creator uh, because he is uh, he's a legend. And uh, he and I, I think that he should be he deserves all the credit in the world from uh, not only cinema circles, but also especially horror film circles. Uh, but he was a Danish film director, screenwriter and actor both in film and on the stage. As a director, he is most well known, known for Haxon. And as an actor, he is best known for his performance in the film Michael in 1924, in which he played Claude Zarette, the male, male lover of the film's title character in a landmark gay film. Yes, you heard that right. Yes, he played the male lover of the film's title character in a landmark gay film. Born, in, uh, born on September 28th, 1879, and September 28th would turn out to be the release date of Haxon uh, in 1922. Uh, Benjamin Christensen was born in Viborg, the youngest of 12 children. He initially studied medicine, but got fascinated with acting and began studying at the Det Kongelig Theater, Royal Danish Theater in Copenhagen in 1901. His professional acting career began in Arthas in 1907, but after a short stint as an actor, he abandoned the stage in order to become a wine salesman. In 1911, Christensen made his debut as a film actor. All of his pre-directorial efforts are lost, but among such films are Sinan's Born, 1913, the only motion picture directed by eminent Norwegian playwright and stage director Bjorn Bjornsson. In 1913, Christensen assumed control of the small Helborg-based production company for which he worked and recognized it as Dansk Biograph Kompany. The first film he directed, Det Hamet's uh, Heads Fod X, or The Mysterious, the Mysterious X, in 1914, was one of the most astonishing directorial debuts in film history. Although a routine spy melodrama, the camera work, cutting, and art direction were revolutionary for the period. Christensen himself played the main role, as he did in his second film, Hobbs Not uh, Once Again, uh, or Blind Justice, 1916. Once again, Christensen portrayed a wrong man, a man wrongly accused of murder, and the artistic quality of his sophomore effort was equal to his first. Despite the success of his first two films, Christensen did not find acceptance within the Danish film ministry, and after Blind Justice, he returned to the stage. Between 1918 and 1921, Christensen researched the history of necromancy as background for his next and greatest film, Haxon, or the, or the Witches or Witchcraft Through the Ages, in which Christensen appeared in the role of Satan. Yes, you heard that right. Uh, the uh, writer and producer and director of Haxon or Witchcraft Through the Ages is appearing as Satan. So stand by for that. Uh, <laughs> a plotless pa panorama of the history of witchcraft, Haxon is a visual tour de force that use, utilizes nudity, gore, and sheer shock value on a level that remains incredible for a silent film. Nevertheless, despite people being plundered by censor boards everywhere, Haxon was an international success. Based on the response to Haxon, Christensen received an invitation from UFA Germany, uh, from UFA to direct in Germany. He made two films for them, though Christensen's most memorable work in Germany was an actor, as an actor in the key supporting role of the painter Claude Zorette in his fellow countryman Carl Theodore Dreyer films Michael, 
1924. This would prove Christensen's last film appearance as an actor. In 1924, MGM swept through the talent pool at UFA and picked up, among others, Christensen, who departed so quickly he may not have completed his second feature, The Women of Ill Repute, in 1925. It was not released until the end of 1925, and by that time, Christensen had already disowned it. Christensen got off a good start with the Norma Shear vehicle, The Devil's Circus, in 1926, a commercial success. But the Lon Chaney vehicle mockery, which followed, was a, was a scandalous failure critically, even as it still generated a modest profit. When work stalled in 1927 on MGM's troubled three-year-long production of The Mysterious Island, 1929, Christensen was let go. He moved to Warner Brothers, where he had made four films. The first was The Hawk's Nest, a crime dra drama starring Milton Spills. The remaining three constitute a horror trilogy and were co-written with Cornell Woolrich. The Haunted House, Seven Footprints to Satan, and House of Horror, 1929. By this time, Christensen had enough of his Hollywood experience, and although House of Horror was a hit, after it wrapped, he went back to Denmark. Afterward, Christensen returned once again to stage direction, did not make another film for a decade, breaking his silence for the Nordisk Company. He wrote and directed Children of Divorce in 1939, a social melodrama about the generation gap. It was a surprise hit, and Christensen seemed back on track again. He followed it with Barnett, The Child, in 1940, a film about abortion, which reunited him with actress Bodil Ibsen, who had appeared alongside Christensen in the Bjornsson film and was herself a director. However, The Lady with the Light Gloves in 1942 was a spy thriller that proved an unmitigated disaster on the level of mockery, and Christensen found himself out of the film business for good. Afterward, he assumed management of a movie theater in a suburb of Copenhagen and lived out the rest of his 79 years in obscurity. Yes, absolutely. And uh, on the Criterion channel, he actually does, uh, in 1941, actually, just uh, just before his last film uh, was a failure, he uh, did, in fact, record a eight-minute introduction for Haxon and uh, looked at it as an interesting experiment in terms of Comparing the silent movie to the to the modern day sound movie, and how the silent movie can offer uh, better representations of dreams and adventures without dialogue. I mean, these illustrations. I mean, I I remember watching the uh, the Australian film uh, Lake Mungo which is one of the creepiest movies I've ever seen. And a lot of the horror is derived from just looking at pictures. No, for real. No, seriously. It, it's, it's so powerful how it relies on pictures to sell, uh, to sell the scares. It's just amazing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need to block uh, some uh, people that don't need to be in here. Okay. During the so-called witch's Sabbath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, for everyone, for joining me tonight. We are 11 minutes. We are 11 minutes into Haxon 1922. I'm watching over at Criterion, the Criterion channel. So Haxon is, of course, Christensen's best-known film. Long circulating in the 16-millimeter market, it was re-edited into a shorter version in 1967 by British filmmaker Anthony Balk with an added jazz score and narration by William S. Burroughs, and as such became a counterculture favorite. Uh, another one that became a favorite uh, during that time was, of course, Freaks, uh, directed by Todd Browning, which uh, looked at um, uh, uh, circus freaks and how they had to deal with the hazing of the, of the so-called normal-looking uh, everyday uh, 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 <laughs> Uh, others working at the circus and everything, <clears throat> but it was actually, uh, you know, made as a as a, a very moving, a slow a slow coy for our tolerance and everything. Uh, it, even though it was presented as a horror movie for MGM, and you know, there are stories of you know 
you know, one woman having a miscarriage, you know, and uh, the movie was ended up chopped chopped up by like a half hour or I mean, and dumped back into theaters over a year later and it still got attacked. But in the 1960s, you know, freak had taken on a completely different uh, uh, definition and thus it was finally embraced by a new generation. And sadly, Todd Browning never knew. Uh, he later directed Dracula with uh, uh, Bela Lugosi for uh, Universal. For the remainder of Christensen's output, losses are heavy and has long been difficult to see. Based on what exists, some critics have concluded that all Christensen's American films were artistic failures. Of the German films, only the first one, His Wife, The Unknown, 1923, has survived, and his Warner Brothers film, Only a Poor Italian Print of Seven Footprints to Satan, has surfaced. Although sound discs exist of House of Horror, critical opinions about The Devil's Circus seem divided. Mockery was one of the most sought after of all lost films until it was finally located in the 1970s. However, many who have seen it have stated that it is easily the worst of Lon Chaney, Chaney's MGM features. The Nordisk films remain little seen outside Denmark. In 1999, the Museum of Modern Art and later the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley held the first retrospective screening of Christensen's work under the rubric Benjamin Christensen an international Dane. Of Christensen, Carl Theodore Dreyer once described him as, quote, a man who knew exactly what he wanted and who pursued his goal with uncompromising stubbornness. After many decades of relative obscurity, Christian is now considered one of the best Danish silent film directors in history. And yes, there is indeed <clears throat> seven parts to Haxon, and we have just uh, started the second part here at the 14-minute mark. And so part one was essentially a scholarly dis a dis dissertation on the appearances of demons and witches in primitive and medieval culture. And um, it uses a number of photographs of stat, uh, stat, uh, stat uh, paintings and woodcuts as demonstrated pieces. In addition, several large-scale models are employed to demonstrate medieval concepts of the structure of the solar system and the commonly accepted depiction of hell. And with part two, uh, we have a series of vignettes that uh, the uh, uh, theatrically demonstrate medieval superstition and beliefs concerning witchcraft, including Satan tempting a sleeping woman away from her husband's bed before terrorizing a group of monks. Also shown as a woman purchasing a love potion uh, from a supposed witch named Karna, in addition to and in order to seduce a monk, and uh, a supposed witch named Appa alone, uh, dreaming of waking up in a castle where Satan presents her with coins that she is unable to hold on to, and festivities that she's unable to participate in. <laughs> participate in. So. Uh, yeah, so that's where we're, what we're watching right now is part two of Haxon. Now, let me just say, uh, let me t take a drink real quick before I continue. Of all the film genres out there, silent film is my absolute favorite. It's the it's what I've done the most uh, research into. I have read a lot of books. I own a lot of books on silent film. Um, many of them, some of them out of print. And uh, like I said, I, I mean, I've studied, I mean, I studied film in college and everything and came to realize that, um, you know, of course, you, you start with the horse and everything and how that was recorded in the 1870s. And then you go into the 1890s with Thomas Edison and the Lumiere brothers and everything. In, in 1896 uh, is what seems to be widely considered the very first uh, uh, film with a narrative. And that is, of course, a movie by Alice Guy Blosh uh, called The Cabbage Fairy. And yes, that came out in 1896. And that was kind of the, uh, the birth of cinema essentially in the 1890s and the the adolescence came in 1903 when we had two significant movies that changed cinema forever 
The first was A Trip to the Moon uh, in 1902, as well as The Great Train Robbery, 1903. And uh, if, you, if anybody's interested in film uh, in terms of its history, you need to watch those two films back to back. They are... Um, you know, amazing to watch. I mean, because even in the 21st century, they are uh, incredible, incredibly entertaining and uh, just eye popping in what they were able to accomplish back then <clears throat> and seeing who was ahead of their time and realizing, wow, we can actually use the medium of film to tell stories. The, now, the first horror film I think is generally considered, although, you know, of course, I mean, there's a lot of arguments and, you know, people would insist on this or that, but uh, uh, it seems to be the first horror film that is generally considered to be uh, the Frankenstein version from 1910. Um, I would argue at the very least that the very first horror film directed by a woman uh, is Lois Weber's uh, Suspense uh, in 1913. I actually, I, I actually took, you know, practically took an entire course on Lois Weber, who was the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the most highest paid director at that time. Yes, she was a woman and she was the highest paid director in Hollywood. And in fact, she was the only one uh, elected into the Directors Guild for many, many years, the only woman for many decades. But uh she wrote the scenario and stars in the film as Valentine Paul, and the fi film features early examples of a split screen shot and a car chase. And and uh, and in 2020, it was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. It's 10 minutes long. Uh, go check it out. I think it's uh, I think it is one of those here again one of those amazing achievements that can't be ignored. And like I said, two years later. Right before Birth of a Nation came out in February of 1915, which we tend to go all the way back there in terms of what starting uh, uh, films and everything. But look, Lois Weber deserves more credit than D.W. Griffith. I'm going to say that right now because uh, she had Hypocrites in January of 1915, which was uh, a massive box office success. Uh, uh, just as big as Birth of a Nation, if not bigger. And it's uh, controversial. It was controversial because of the fact that it showed a nude woman transparently. But yes, she was still very much nude on screen. And it definitely caused uh, quite a stir back then. Definitely. And I know, I know we're watching uh, Haxon. I know we're going to go back to Haxon in a minute here. But just to let you know about uh, hypocrites, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the nude scenes were shot on a closed set with only Weber, who directed the scenes, Edwards, and the cameraman. Uh, they devised special photographic techniques for the film, which was shot by George W. Hill. Uh, the use of the film of traveling double exposure sequences of the woman is considered an impressive achievement for 1915. It is thought that Weber may have re-edited the film after early reviews were published before its official opened on January 20th, 1915 at the Longacre Theater, in New York City. I mean, that was a month before uh, Birth of a Nation came out. And like I said, Lois Weber barely got any recognition as a, uh, as a director at that time. And it's just amazing. The great irony is that after, uh, after the 19th Amendment and women got the right to vote, there, there were no more women directors in Hollywood for uh, 50 years. With two exceptions, of course, there was Dorothy Arzner in the 1940s and uh, 30, 30s and 40s. And then uh, Ida Lupino uh, directed a lot of socially conscious films in the uh, in the early 50s. But anyway, going a little too far off topic here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I know. I, I mean, I, I I've seen my fair share of silent films and I've done my sh fair share of reading about silent films. Uh, particularly on Universal and, you know, how, you know, what led up to the uh, Universal monster movies to be created and such. Uh, Lon Chaney, uh, definite. Uh, he, I mean, he also made one of the best silent film uh, horrors, which was uh, The Phantom of the Opera, which, of course, is legendary for that unmasking and everything. So 
So we are we are watching Haxon. We are about 22 minutes in. We are 22 minutes into Haxon witchcraft through the ages. Yeah. So and like I said, the other big silent horror movie, uh, which is uh, I think probably more well known than Haxon, even though I, I, I here again I slightly prefer Haxon, is of course Nosferatu, and uh, you know. That was essentially a ripoff of Dracula, where the widow of the author actually sued, uh, and I think even won. I think I, if I remember correctly, she even won. Uh, but luckily, we managed to uh, save Nosferatu, which, of course, has been remade in 1979. And hopefully, we should get a Robert Eggers remake here again. And it's interesting I bring up Robert Eggers because, uh, of course, he directed The Witch in 2016, uh, which I think is uh, one of the great witch movies, of course. Uh, just to let everybody know that I do have a fetish for witch cinema. I do. I do. <laughs> Look, I... I, I I don't know. I, I almost cannot explain it. But, you know, when it comes to like werewolves or vampires or, you know, any, any of those things, witches are always my favorite. Which, and uh, I will watch anything with witches in it. Oh, L Lanferno isn't considered horror, but it watches, it watches like one. Yes, I have seen that. I have seen that movie. Yes, I, I assure you I have seen that movie. And you, you may be right. You may be right. I mean, that, that, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say, but, you know, about 1910, 1911, I think would be a good indication on when the horror film really started to, uh, you know, the first ones actually kind of slithered through before it became its own genre. But uh, yeah, that is a, that is an important film. That is a definite infer uh, important film, The Inferno. And uh, what was also an amazing discovery uh, a while back was uh, the 1912 version of Richard III, uh, which uh, is about an hour long and everything. Yeah, I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm so hoping that we discover more silent films. But to be perfectly honest in my heart of hearts, you know, it's been a century, obviously, 100-year 100, uh, 100 anniversary of Haxon. It's been a century when all these silent films were made. If if any were going to show up, I think they would have shown up by now. And I think that I think I hate to say it, but I'm, I, I think all hope is lost in finding any other lost films. And believe me, only, uh, only 20% of all silent films survive. That's why I have a uh, special love for silent cinema because it's, um, it's its own unique, uh, it's its own unique uh, pocket in the in in the history of cinema. Of course, it was kind of sort of briefly regenerated in uh, <laughs> 20, uh, 2011 when we had uh, the artist, which I did like. The artist, as a silent film fan, I did like it. I'm not sure I would have given it best picture, but look, I liked it as a Valentine to silent cinema. My only objection to the artist was um, the fact that they used the music from Vertigo, and it took me out of the setting as well as the time period. I mean, we're supposed to be in the early 1930s at the dawn of sound coming into cinema, and here you're putting in Bernard Herrmann's music from the 1957 movie. He didn't have to do that. And I understand Ke uh, Kim Novak's complaints about that, and I completely empathize with her. But I think calling it a rape was like just a, a tiny bit too much. Like, look, I feel for you. I get, I get it. I mean, it, you know, I just felt it was unnecessary as opposed to being offensive. You know, as with witchcraft, people's belief in him was so strong during the Middle Ages that he became real. Oh, yeah, we're about to meet Benjamin Christensen very soon as the devil. Oh, my God. Ladies and gentlemen, writer, producer, director Benjamin Christensen as the devil is everywhere and takes all shapes. He shows himself as a nightmare, a raging demon, a seducer, a lover, and a knight. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. This is a quintessential movie to, to watch on Halloween, I think, personally. I, I couldn't think of a better pick than this one, especially the timing 
of it being the 100th anniversary. Now, among, uh, among the other silent horrors, I mean, there's not really a lot of them. There's admittedly not, not a lot of them at all. But among the others, we have uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. We also have the Phantom of the Opera with uh, Long Cheney. Mm -hmm. We also have the Gollum and the Phantom Carriage. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, the Cat and the Canary, there is a silent version of Cat and the Canary, for sure. The Hands of Orlock, Waxworks, and I can't say that's about it, because, of course, there's been many more. But here again, a lot of them are, have been lost to time. In fact, the ones I just mentioned to you are the ones that are pretty much available to view today. Phantom, uh, Phantom Carriage was also released on uh, Blu-ray, courtesy of of uh, Criterion, which that is a, a wonderful uh, film to watch as well. Now, Be Benjamin Christensen said in his introduction to the uh, 1941 re-release that he uh, uh, thought it was a joy playing the devil. But he also prefers the devil being depicted in a silent film like this as opposed to a sound film, because it's like, well, how how how, do, how should we know how the devil will sound? Well, and of course, it makes me think of what Robert Eggers did in The Witch, when uh, you know he, he he made him into a, like a Spanish uh, you know adventure or something like that, a conquistador. You know, it's like, wouldst thou like to live delicious? Yeah. And, you know, can I just say, and look, anybody out there in the chat, give me your favorite witch movie. I'm begging you, please give me your favorite witch, witch movie and tell, and tell me why exactly you love that movie so much. You know, in 2016, and I always try to choose movies that, I mean, movies that are completely different in every genre every year. Uh, you know, for instance, I might choose a Western one year, then another year I would choose a comedy. Next year I would choose a drama. I would try to jump to a completely different genre every single year in choosing my favorite number one film of the year. Well, in 2016, there were two witch movies that came out. The Witch, directed by Robert Eggers, and uh, The Love Witch, directed by Anna Biller, which is now one of my favorite movies of all time. This is a glorious, glorious movie starring Samantha Robinson that if you haven't seen yet, all I'm saying is you have no idea what you're missing. You, you honestly have no idea what you're missing. This is a masterpiece, one of the great 21st century films, virtually unanimous uh, feedback and critical acclaim on, uh, you know, everywhere you go and when you look this up and... You know, I've been waiting for uh, forever for Anna Biller's new movie. But yeah, 2016 was the uh, season of The Witch or the year of The Witch with Robert Eggers' The Witch and uh, Anna Biller's The Love Witch. Uh, while the Blair Witch movie, the new one, uh, it didn't even crack the top 50. But, you know, look, I mean, and it's funny I bring up Blair Witch because most people that have heard of Haxon will know that the, that uh, it was the company that uh, the men behind Blair Witch Project founded. In uh, It was the production company behind, behind Blair Witch Project, was Haxon Films. Yeah, Daniel Myrick uh, and Eduardo Sanchez, who both wrote and directed the Blair Witch Project, they had founded the production company Haxon Films in Orlando, Florida. They are famous for producing the cult classic independent horror film, The Blair Witch Project, and it's taken literally from this uh, movie, The Haxon or The Witch. I prefer, the, I prefer the, uh, the translation of The Witch as opposed to just witchcraft through the ages, even though they both work you know, either, either, either or work just fine. But um, the company was founded by five graduates of the University of Central Florida film program, Eduardo Sanchez, Greg Hale, Daniel Myrick, Robin Cowie, and Michael Manello. The company sustained itself by producing television commercials and corporate videos. The Blair Witch Project was the company's first feature him, film, a horror film in the style of a pseudo documentary. <clears throat> 
And of course, uh, the Blair Witch Project was, of course, a uh, marketing phenomenon. Uh, it was only made for less than five hundred thousand dollars, and it made nearly two hundred and fifty million. Uh, that's uh, what of a, a big deal that Blair Witch Project was. It was the biggest independent film up until that time. I mean, I knew it was fake from the get go, but it still terrified the shit out of me. Uh, I uh, I bought into it completely of the whole idea of, you know, these three filmmakers who go into the woods uh, to investigate, you know, these legends involving witches and, you know, child kidnappers and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, mass murderers, you know, all these legends and superstitions and how, uh, you know, eventually it, it comes to the point where they can't even escape the woods they were in. And they think that the the Blair Witch might, in fact, be the one uh, keeping them locked inside. Oh, this is extraordinary like here. Look at this. Look at this. I mean, Haxon is just full of the most uh, unforgettable haunting imagery that you could ever hope or expect in this type of, of, of film. Black Sunday, always uh, love the story and overall look of the film. Ah, wow. Mm. Sanchez and Myrick had the idea to create their own horror film in 1993 while they were still in school. They were discussing what made horror films scary and why they had not had any particularly scary horror film in a long time. They discussed films that scared them in their childhood, such as Chariots of the Gods and The Legend of Boggy Creek, which I did a commentary on earlier, and also recalled how scary the television show In Search Of was. That hat was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, and it was like a precursor to unsolved mysteries terrifying absolutely terrifying uh, sanchez concluded that what scared him in the case of films about unidentified flying objects such as he similarly found that films such as exorcist and shining were terrifying because they played on psychological fears mm -hmm. we are uh 34 minutes and 30 seconds 34 minutes and 30 seconds into Benjamin Christensen's Haxon. In Rights and Rights in the German Past by Franz Heinemann, we can observe pictures of Inquisition judges at work. So, yeah, I believe we've reached part three. Now, okay, so the, I mean, parts three through five. Uh, taken all together is basically, you know, it's set in the Middle Ages, and this narrative is used to demonstrate the treatment of suspected witches by the relig religious authorities of the time. A printer named Jesper dies in bed, and his family consequently accuses an old woman, Maria the Weaver, of causing his death through witchcraft. Jesper's wife, Anna, visits the residence of traveling Inquisition judges, grasping one of their arms in desperation, asking that they try Maria for witchcraft. Now, I believe this is Christensen himself pointing all, all this stuff out on the screen here with, um, I'm not sure if it's a pencil or what exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. I can't really tell what exactly he uses. I mean, uh, but uh, I will now illustrate a witch trial from beginning to end that it takes place at the time when the Pope sent traveling Inquisition judges in Germany. Oh, boy. And see, like, uh, these, feel, th these scenes just feel eerily authentic. I mean, they just, they feel all too authentic. I can believe all of this happening at the time. Which cast a spell on him. Here again, it's the hysteria. It's all about the damn hysteria, man. So Maria the Weaver is going to be uh, accused of witchcraft here. But that's the thing is that uh, you know Black, Black Sunday, yeah, that that's a that's a great pick, great pick. But look, I, I'll watch any movie with witches. I'll even watch uh, the Hocus Pocus films, which I actually thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and 
And there, of course, was the Jim Henson movie from 1990 with Angelica Houston. And, you know, you know, of course, like the witches in like the Wizard of Oz, for instance. I mean, the, you know, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West gave me nightmares at the age of four. <laughs> you know. But I've always had a fetish for, for witch films. I can't really explain it, but uh, it's my favorite of all the, uh, you know, horror uh, subgenres. And, of course, Haxon is, of course, the, as far as I'm concerned, the cream of the crop when it comes to uh, witch movies. I don't think anything will ever surpass it. I don't think anything will ever surpass its impact, its effect, it's, uh, you know, it's information, it's research. I mean, and it genuinely is scary. It is genuinely frightening. And I got to say about silent films is that I always prefer the prints when they're tinted. I mean, uh, a lot. I think that's uh, like an ongoing discussion because, uh, you know, a lot of the tints were put in later. But I, I think, you know, and I think a lot of times when it comes to Kino and these other companies that release these silent films on uh, Blu-ray and DVD, that, um, you know, they feel the need to, you know, put it in, you know, like original sepia tone throughout the entire way and maybe provide an alternate tinted version, which I like. But I don't know. It all started with, with of course, Charlie Chaplin's The Gold Rush. I saw The Gold Rush on television and I immediately fell in love with silent film. Uh, and, of course, they used heavy tints in that. You know, when he was out in the snow, it would be blue. When he was inside a cabin, it would be uh or uh, red, you know, because of the fire and it would be warm and everything. So you get the idea, you know, I mean, and you kind of, you know, like I said, it gets the idea when you're outside with them in the, in the snow and the avalanches and everything like you're, you're, you, you literally feel the chill when you see the blue on screen, almost bleeding on, onto you and uh, you're feeling it like ice. I mean, seriously, but I, I I've always enjoyed uh, silent films that have actually tints. Oh, Eric, uh, Eric, lovely to see you. I actually need to watch more witch movies, but I like the Eggers film because it went for period accuracy. Yes, absolutely. Also, Witches of Eastwick because of the contemporary setting. Yes, I'm glad somebody brought up Witches of Eastwick also. But yeah, Robert Eggers, you know, of course, it, you know, all the dialogue is in uh, old English. Uh, you know, I actually studied that when I did more, uh, when I studied uh, Canterbury Tales uh, in depth in college. And I also have the uh, Peter Paolo Pasolini movie uh, on a uh, Criterion set behind me. <clears throat> but uh, like I said, what I found fascinating about The Witch is that he, he actually took the risk of presenting the dialogue as it would have been spoken back then in uh, back then in the, in the, in the 17th century. And you know, I went back to the theater two, three times just because I wanted to hear the dialogue again and again and again, while many others were, were kind of confused by it. I mean, but uh, it made it feel so authentic. It made you feel like you were actually there with this family, you know, you know, and there's this witch in the woods that is uh, ready to just, you know, take over their lives. Yeah, terrifying. But yeah, witches of Eastwick. I have seen Witches, uh, Witches of Eastwick many times. I've seen it for, uh, you know since I was a teenager. My uh, father loved Jack Nicholson in that movie, and of course he was hilarious when he, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> when they uh, when they start putting the needles in the in the uh, in the doll and everything, and he starts to feel the sharp pain near the end, and he gets you know flown into a church and all that. That's all amazing stuff. I kind of hope, I wish that we could have an adaptation of Witches of Eastwick that was more in line with the John Updike novel. Uh, that was actually an instance where I actually preferred the novel over the movie adaptation, even though, look, I thought Cher and Michelle Pfeiffer and Susan Sarandon, they were all amazing. Uh, they were sexy. They were dynamite. 
Uh, I would have loved to have had them as uh, witches in a mansion in my bed, uh, needless to say. Uh, but, you know, I mean, like I said, Witches of Eastwick is still a hell of an entertaining movie. It's still a, a hell of an entertaining movie. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. And uh, if you want to throw like Halloween three season, of the witch in there, <clears throat> I'd be okay with that. Except for the fact there's not really a witch in the movie, <laughs> you know, and I do agree with people about, you know, if it was called just season of the witch, it probably would have done better in theaters. Uh, true now. And of course we also have like Suspiria, you know, when it comes to other movies about witchcraft and everything, uh, what, what other ones are we missing here? Whether well, it's warlock, uh, there's Rosemary's Baby, of course, Spirited Away, uh, Eve's Bayou, yeah. Oh, I Married a Witch, 1942 with Frederick March. Oh, that 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 one's a classic right there. That's a good one too. And of course, uh, Bell Book and Candle with Kim Novak, which uh, she and uh, James Stewart made the same year as Vertigo. Also, well worth seeing. And, uh, oh, and yeah, my favorite Rob Zombie film, The Lords of Salem. Oh, let me tell you something about Rob Zombie. I, I need to share this all with you because, look, you know, a lot of people, you know, tend to dump on Rob Zombie as a filmmaker and everything. And, of course, you know, with his recent release of The Monsters, you know, you know, he's gotten a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, he's... He's got, gotten a lot of negative reviews because of the monsters, even though I actually thoroughly like the monsters. Let me tell you something. I discovered Rob Zombie, not because of his music, but because of the fact that he did uh, a show on Turner Classic Movies late at night called uh, like Midnight Cinema or, or TCM After Dark or something like that, where, you know, he would look at um, older horror movies, specifically silent horror. Yeah, not, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. In fact, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to remember what the name of it was. I know it had some kind of special name. But, and he only did it for like a few years. TCM Underground, hosted by Rob Zombie. That's exactly what it was. TCM Underground, hosted by Rob Zombie. Well... He actually introduced a 1928 film with Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces, uh, who also played Phantom of the Opera. Uh, he, uh, he introduced a film called West of Zanzibar. And uh, yeah, if you've heard of West of Zanzibar, then you know your silent film history because, yeah, that is uh, a Lon Chaney film. And uh yeah, I, I was just, you know, I loved hearing Rob Zombie just talk about his love for this film. And, uh, you know, yeah, he was doing the TCM Underground for a while. So he does love silent film. He does love silent film as well, which is pretty cool. Maria the Weaver was just brought here, accused of witchcraft. Yes, indeed. But this is an absolutely immaculate print, courtesy of Criterion. I want to applaud them for this uh, for this uh, wonderful, wonderful print. Yeah, definitely. Probably the definitive version. I mean, unless we get a 4K somewhere down the road. And uh, one more thing to throw on top of my silent film uh, uh, addiction. Uh, I remember when I traveled to uh, San Francisco uh, to see the five and a half hour version of Napoleon on the big screen. And, you know, there were like, you know, major movie socialites there, you know, like Leonard Malton, Stephen Tobolowsky, you know, uh, a number of familiar faces. I mean, I forget all of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they went to go see this five and a half hour movie that was just playing over four showtimes. Uh, during one week in Oakland. And, uh, you know, there were three breaks, including a dinner break. Tickets were about $100. And uh, just one of the most amazing uh, theatrical experiences of my life. And it was with a live orchestra. The 1927 film Napoleon, uh, uh, directed, 
uh, directed by Abel Gantz. And it's uh, well known because uh, at the end of the film, the screen splits into three different sections into what they call a triptych presentation. And let me tell you, it is just unforgettable. It's absolutely unforgettable. Forgettable. Uh, I've seen a couple of other silent movies in theaters with orchestras, uh, namely uh, Metropolis. I went to go see the restored version of Metropolis in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've also seen uh, Manhandled, a uh, 1924 film uh, at the silent theater in L.A. If I remember correctly, Manhandled had, yeah, it was directed by Alan Duane and starring Gloria Swanson. Yeah, about a shop girl who was invited by her boss to a fun party. There she acts like Rush, like a Russian duchess, and the owner of an expensive department store hires her to attract customers. As she finds her way in the New York's higher milieu, she alienates most of her friends. So those are, you know, those are among the uh, silent films that I've seen in theaters, just to give you an idea on, uh, you know, how much uh, how much I love silent films. I recently just saw in the theater uh, Pearl, the uh, Ty West sequel to X, and uh, his love of silent film and that is, silent film is apparent in that as well. Uh, Martin Scorsese noted that as well. There is a rare poster for um, uh, Tita Barra's Cleopatra from 1917, which was the number one film of the year. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the most sought after of all silent films. Uh, I would say I'd rather watch that than uh, Greed. Eric von Stroheim's Greed is cited as the, um, well, the uh, the uh, the uncut lost eight-hour version uh, is is typically the most sought after of all lost silent films. But no, give me, give me Tita Bear and uh, uh, Cleopatra, baby. There is actually a poster of Tita Bear's Cleopatra in uh, Pearl that Ty West puts in. And I just, there's a long loving shot of that as uh, the lead character played by Mia Goth, you know, puts her bicycle right underneath the poster and goes to meet the projectionist. Uh, but yeah, Ty West, you know, that was like a love letter to silent cinema right there. Absolutely. All right, we are approximately 49 minutes and 30 seconds. 49 minutes and 30 seconds into Haxon. Yeah. Now, uh, as uh, parts three and five go along, the see Maria is arrested after being tortured by inquisitors, admits to involvement in rich witchcraft. She describes giving birth to children fathered by Satan, being smeared with witch ointment, and attending a witch's Sabbath. Now, this is all stuff that Benjamin Christensen talks about in the introduction to the 1941 uh, re-release. Uh, re uh, the witch ointment or flying ointment is basically like a, a hallucinogenic ointment said to have been used by witches in the practice of witchcraft, uh, which in, you know involve fat and other, other oily stuff. Uh, list of the ingredients ointment is the fat of children digged out of their graves, of juices of smallage, wolfbane, and sink foil mingled with a meal of fine wheat. I mean, like in Robert Eggers, The Witch. I mean, the first, uh, uh, the baby snatch, uh, the uh, the witch snatches the baby and uh, basically, you know, cuts it all up and puts it all over her skin to get uh, youthful again. Yeah, that's that witch ointment for you. <laughs> that is that witch ointment for you. And uh, Maria claims witches and sorcerers desecrated a cross, feasted with demons, and kissed Satan's buttocks. Oh, yes, that is all here in Haxon. I got to admit, when I saw the witches line up and kiss Satan's buttocks one at a time, I just shook my head, had my jaw dropped, and thought, you know, why do I have a feeling this, this probably happened sometime back in the Middle Ages? That is such a scary, scary Scary thought. But uh, Luke and Rob and Eric, I hope you're all enjoying uh, Haxon tonight, this 100th anniversary commentary. And uh, wow, these witches look even better than the ones in the, the, the uh, Wizard of Oz. 
<laughs> I'm not joking about that. This, you know, like I said, this came out 17 years earlier. That is just amazing, amazing photography. Writer Chris Fujiwara notes the way in which the film, quote, places together on the same level of cinematic depiction, fact and fiction, objective reality, and hallucination. He writes that the realism with which the fantasy scenes are staged and acted hardly differs from the style of the workshop ones, which we have had no reason not to accept as taking place within reality. And that, as such, the audience is led into, quote, into a space where the irrational is always ready to intrude in lewd for forms, unquote. Fujiwara highlights a moment in the film in which Christensen claims that actress Marin Peterson, between takes, raised her tired face to me and said, quote, the devil is real. I have seen him sitting by my bedside, unquote. Fujiwara writes, no doubt Christensen was conscious of the analogy between the character's confession to the Inquisitors and the actor's confession to him between their torture implements and his camera by likening his own activities as a director to the deeds of the Inquisitors, Christensen was puts himself near the head of a self-critical tradition in cinema that would later include Jean-Luc Godard and Abbas Kiarostami. Academic Chloe Germain Buckley referred to Haxon's examination of witchcraft as quasi-feminist in Nature, writing, quote, Christensen focuses on the history of witchcraft in order to show the way that the oppression of women takes on different guises in different historical periods. Using ideas from the psychoanalytic theory that, that was emerging at the time, Christian suggests a link between contemporary diagnosis of hysteria and the Euro European witch hunts of the medieval and early modern eras. This connection casts the 20th century physician who would confine troubled young women in his clinic in the role of the Inquisitor. Buckley connects tropes of witchcraft references in Haxon, such as witches consuming infants, or transforming into animals to a perceived illegitimacy of female power. And that, as such, the evil witch stereotype has become such a convenient tool for the propagation of misogynistic ideas. She also notes that the film suggests an intersection of gender and social class. Witches are not only women, they are poor women. Regarding the scenes featuring Sister Celia being influenced by Satan in the film's final two segments, Author Alan Silver asserts the presence of an underlying theme of sexual repression. He claims that the film has a libertarian message, with demonic possession being a result of the unnatural sexual continence that is demanded of the young nuns. The film therefore follows a broadly Freudian line in linking possessions to hysteria. The basis of this idea is that repressed sexual desires are dynamic and rather than lying dormant, actively find ways of being fulfilled in exaggerated and extreme ways. And uh, just to give anybody an idea, everybody an idea of what the production of this film was like, after finding a copy of the Malleus Maleficarum in a Berlin bookshop, Christensen spent two years, 1919 to 1921, as it says in the opening, uh, in the opening, studying manuals, illustrations, and treatises on witches and witch hunting. He included a lengthy bibliography in the original playbill of the film's premiere. He intended to create an entirely new film rather than an adaptation of literary fiction, which was the case for films of that day. In principle, I am against these adaptations. I seek to find the way toward to original films. Christensen obtained funding from the large Swedish production company Svensk Film Industry, preferring it over the local Danish film studios so that he could maintain complete artistic freedom. He used the money to buy and refurbish the Astra Film Studio in Hellerup, Denmark. Filming then ran from February to October 1921. Christensen and cinematographer Johan Ankerstigeby fil filmed only at night or in closed set to maintain the film's dark hue. Post-production required another year before the film premiered in late 1922. Total cost for Svensk film, including refurbishing the Astra Film Studio, reached between 1.5 and 2 million kroner, making Haxon the most expensive Scandinavian silent film in history and here they're all kissing satan's ass 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you just saw a bunch of women kiss Satan's ass on screen. Well, in the devils, you see a bunch of nuns trying to, uh, uh, you know, eat uh, Jesus's genitalia. So, you know, I guess it's not much different, right? <laughs> yeah, if you've never seen The Devils, directed by Ken Russell, uh, I did a commentary on that last year. I had some guests on board for that. Oh, that was amazing. That was an amazing, amazing film to watch. And Warner Brothers, is a, uh, you know, kept it suppressed, you know, kept it locked up and suppressed, uh, never, seemingly never going to release it and never going to let an, uh, uh, another company release it at all, which is such a shame because um, it's definitely sought after by horror fans, most, uh, most definitely sought after. The film makes use of a number of special effects techniques in the depictions of the occult, including puppetry and stop motion animation. Various demons are portrayed by actors wearing special effects makeup. Superimposition is used to depict witches flying over villages and having out of body experiences in their sleep. And reverse motion is used in one sequence to make coins appear to fly from a table into the air. Haxon has had numerous different li uh, live scores over the years. When it premiered in Sweden, its accompaniment was compiled from pre-existing compositions. Details of the selection, which met with the director's enthusiastic approval, have been lost. But it was probably the same documented music as for the Copenhagen premiere two months later. Uh, in Copenhagen, it was uh, played by a 50-piece orchestra, and the score combining pieces by Schubert, Gluck, and Beethoven was restored and recorded with a smaller ensemble by arranger conductor Julian Anderson for the 2001 Criterion Collection DVD. The film premiered on September 18, 1922, in four Swedish cities, Stockholm, Helsingborg, Malmo, and Gothenburg, simultaneously unusual for Sweden at the time. Haxen received its Danish premiere in Copenhagen on November 7th, 1922, and was re-released in Denmark in 1931 with an extended introduction by Christensen. The intro titles were also changed in this version. In 1968, Metro Pictures Corporation re-edited and re-released Haxen in the United States as Witchcraft Through the Ages, adding narration by William S. Burroughs and jazz score by Daniel Humer, which was played by a quintet that included John Locke Ponty on violin. Now, you can also watch Witchcraft Through the Ages through the Criterion channel. It's about 75 minutes long, as opposed to the original uh, uh, Danish version, which is about 105 minutes. Speaking of which, we are coming up on the 60-minute mark. We are coming up on the 60-minute mark for Haxon, and we have about 45 minutes left to go. Yeah. Hope you all are enjoying the film. <clears throat> Haxon received lukewarm response from critics upon its original release. As academic James Kendrick wrote, Initial reviews of the film were confounded by its boundary-crossing aesthetic. Its thematic content stirred controversy as well. A contemporary take in Variety, for example, praised the film's acting, production, and its many scenes of unadulterated horror, for, but added that wonderful though this picture is, it is absolutely unfit for public exhibition. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the movie's wonderful. It's just not fit for the public. You know, <laughs> that's probably the best criticism of Haxon at that time. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, a Copenhagen reviewer was likewise offended by its, quote, satanic perverted cruelty that blazes out of it. The cruelty we all know has staged the ages like an evil shaggy beast. The, the chimera of mankind, but when it is captured, let it be locked up in a cell, either in a prison or a madhouse. Do not let it be presented with music by Wagner or Chopin to young men or women who have entered the enchanted world of a movie theater. Conversely, a critic for the New York Times wrote in 1929, the picture is for the most part fantastically conceived and directed, holding the onlooker, onlooker onlooker in a sort of medieval spell 
Most of the characters seem to have stepped from primitive paintings. The film also came to acquire a cult following among surrealists who greatly admired its subversion of cult cultural norms of the time. And as for retrospective assessments, Haxon has become regarded by critics and scholars as Christensen's finest work. It has a 91 approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, listed in the reference book, A Thousand and One Movies to See Before You Die. Stephen J. Schneider writes in the book, part earnest academic exercise in correlating ancient fears with misunderstanding about mental illness and part salacious horror movie, Haxon is truly a unique work that still holds power to a nerve, even in today's jaded era. Author James J. Muley praised the film's makeup effects, sets, costumes, and casting, as well as Christensen's, quote, dynamic combination of both stage tricks and innovative camera techniques. David Sanjak of Pop Matters wrote, the dazzling manner in which Haxon shifts from illustrated lecture to historical reenactment to special effects shots of witches on their broomsticks, to modern uh, dress drama pointed to ways the documentary format could be used that others would not draw until years into the future. Peter Cowie similarly argued in 80 Years of Cinema that it established Christensen as an auteur of uncommon imagination and with a pictorial flair far ahead of his time. Time Out London called it a weird and rather wonderful brew of fiction, documentary, and animation. Film critic Leonard Malton awarded the film three out of possible four stars, lauding it as visually stunning and genuinely scary. He additionally praised the director's performance as Satan. Ghost Watch screenwriter Stephen Volk regards the film as a visceral experience disguised as an erudite thesis and sets it, and sets it in the same league as Nosferatu and Vampire. And the Swedish Film Institute has carried out three restorations of Haxon. The first was in 1976, which was a tinted photochemical restoration. The second was another tinted photochemical restoration in 2007. And then finally, the tinted, tinted digital restoration, which is what I'm watching now on the Criterion channel from 2016. The 1976 restoration was released on DVD in the U.S., and the United Kingdom in 2001 by Criterion and Tartan Video, along with Witchcraft Through the Ages, the 1968 Burroughs version. And the 2007 restoration was released on DVD in Sweden by Svenska Film Institute. In 2019, the Criterion Collection released the 2016 digital restoration exclusively on Blu-ray in the United States. All right, now we got a couple of, uh, we got several retro, uh, we got several um, 100th anniversary articles that I'd like to look at here real quick, if I may. Uh, BBC, uh, why documentary horror Haxon still terrifies a century on? And this was written by Adam Scoville on September 28th of 2022. As it turns 100, this utterly chilling silent film deserves more celebration given it set the template for Blair Witch Project and many more horrors besides. In the lineage of horror cinema, 1922 surely counts as one of its most important years. The year in which F.W. Marneau made his unofficial Dracula adaptation Nosferatu, providing an early scare for audiences even as he fell about foul to copyright breaches. However, around the same time as Marneau's film, another seminal, but today less celebrated uh, horror was released. The Swedish produced Haxon Witchcraft Through the Ages by Danish director Benjamin Christensen. Whereas Murnau defined narrative horror through powerful German expressionist visuals, the Danish director of the Svensk film industry production innovated with a uh, horror's form, creating one of the strangest films of the period, whose eerie atmosphere, stark visuals, and experimentation still stand up today. Part documentary essay, part horror mood board, Haxon is an episodic film, which across seven chapters explores a range of beliefs and themes throughout the Western history of occultism, in particular focusing on witchcraft, 
during the medieval period and the historical persecution of women accused of practicing it. Though no one describes the film better than the director himself, who suggests at the time that my film has no continuous story, no plot, it could perhaps be best be classified as a cultural history le lecture in moving pictures. Mm -hmm. Yet, uh, Haxon is not simply a documentary or a docudrama. Christensen's skill in special effects and sheer visual panache means that as soon as the film shifts from its essayistic stance, Haxon punches as hard as any horror film from its era. Its imagery is some of the most unnerving made in the silent period, as it conjures up depictions of occult practices and scenarios, from people converting with devils to child sacrifice. Quote, it perfectly balances the beautiful and the grotesque, and there are some scenes that are truly bizarre, says artist and founder of the folk horror revival project, Andy Hasarek. I don't believe for a moment the director's real motive was anything other than to shock, according to Stephen Volk. Uh, <laughs> in creating its terrifying scenes, it also deploys a vast array of visual trickery to great haunting effect, from stop motion animation and incredibly inventive makeup to even using a carousel to create the effect of witches flying on their rooms. In some instances, it's as almost as if those old carved wood images detailing witchcraft and heretical punishment of yore have been momentarily brought to life with Christensen as a kind of blasphemous ringmaster, joyfully overseeing it all. It's equally telling that the director himself ends up playing the devil on screen, clearly relish, relishing every satanic minute. Christensen's innovation doesn't end end in the horror scenes, but extends all the way to the closing chapters of the film, in which he offers a 20th century psychological interpretation of the strange occurrences he has depicted. It's a choice that imbues the film with an almost unbearable sadness. The final chapter of Haxton is largely constructed around the idea that esoteric behavior had its roots in, roots in mental disorder and was subsequently de demised due to sheer prejudice. Alongside that, the film also explores how the per persecution of the innocent, including supposed witches, for unproven indiscretion, uh, came about via a weaponized accusation designed to protect notions of piety. The dramatic potential for such accusations later formed the basis of another horror subgenre that included films such as Michael Reeves's Witchfinder General, Gordon Hessler's Cry of the Banshee, and Adrian Hoven's Mark of the Devil all finding bloody purchase in the torture such accusations often demanded, rather than treating such violence purely voyeuristically, as those films sometimes did. However, Haxon provides genuine insight into how the misunderstanding of earthly psychological issues resulted in a fearful response to human suffering, a perspective which saw psychic ailments as in communion with unholy realms. Now, Haxon wasn't the first film to locate horror with the dark depths of the human psyche, though it was certainly the most sympathetic. And ultimately, though, for all its highly disturbing horror visuals, what makes Haxon stand out is its psychological pathos. The combination of this with its essayistic form makes it unique. While the director doesn't entirely dismiss the possibility of devils and demons, the human pain and distress it depicts is the same. Whatever is going on, and the focus on this makes for a surprisingly humane conclusion to what is still a terrifying film, even 100 years on. And that wasn't his entire article. There's much more to it. But that was from Adam Scoville from BBC Culture, uh, written on September 28th, 2022. But we got many more. Oh, we got so much more. Uh, the World, the Flesh, and the Devil. Haxon, Witchcraft Through the Ages at 100. And this was published at Bloody Disgusting uh, by Brian Kuyper on October 26, 2022. So just five days ago. This is what he wrote about Haxon. Danish director Benjamin Christensen presents Haxon under the guise of a teaching tool, a filmic lecture on the history of witchcraft. But this is something of a ruse. By wrapping his intentions with this, within this format, 
Christensen was able to frankly and graphically depict some of the most taboo subjects and images of the age. Today, it might be called an essay film, a kind of pseudo documentary with reenactments, a thesis, and a definite point of view. Though it remains quite neutral at first, the film's biases become more and more clear as it unspools. The first act of the film is primarily ancient drawings and woodcuts, laying out beliefs about the cosmos, good and evil, God's hell, and the devil, the witches, from ancient Persia and Egypt to the Middle Ages in Europe. This section serves as an overview for the entire film, which, starting with the second act, primarily plays out in reenactments based upon these images and the ideas they present. This is all just a gateway to the transgressive subjects that Haxon will explore. Soon after two grave robbers enter and unveil a corpse, they intend to decide, dissect for an, uh, anatomical research, which was considered an act of witchcraft in the time depicted. Throughout the course of the film, Christensen presents a number of images that were considered too strong for many audiences throughout the world in 1922. Indeed, the film faced a great deal of censorship in Germany, England, the United States, and just about everywhere else. It was shown outside of Christensen's native Denmark and Sweden, where the film was financed. Among those images are two women urinating in buckets and throwing the contents against the door of a person they wish to curse. Unmistakable masturbatory imagery of the devil, played by Christensen himself at a better churn, nudity, images of torture, possessed nuns, flagellation of a monk with clear sadomasochistic overtones, spitting on a wood carving of the child Jesus, and desecration of the communion host believed in some religious dogmas to be the body of Christ. Most transgressive of all is the extended sequence of the witch's Sabbath. The sequence is presented as the confession under torture of an old woman accused of witchcraft by a corrupt and superstitious inquisition of monks. In it, she discusses much of what Christensen presented in the first act, but here it is presented not through artist renditions, graphic reenactment. The sequence includes a group of women treading and dancing upon a cross on the ground, the blood sacrifice of a baby, sex with demons, and the kissing of the devil's backside in a decoration of devotion to him. The sequence is filled with nudity, sexual imagery, demons, and various forms of debauchery that remain potent even 100 years later. This dreamlike sequence is the most famous section of the film, the one that this has the most direct influence on film history. Fingerprints can clearly be seen on films as diverse as Night on Bald Mountain scene of Walt Disney's Fantasia and Rosemary's Baby. In order to make its points, Haxon also utilizes a number of impressive technical achievements. Through extensive use of puppetry, stop motion, reverse photography, and super superimposition, Christensen depicts witches flying on broomsticks, a demon tearing its way through a door, the seduction of greed and power through wealth with dancing coins and much more. The makeup effects of the demons are also incredibly impressive, particularly for the time, and are presented as full body costumes and masks. Not to be ignored, the photogenic effects from cinematographer Johann Angstergern, who invented a number of techniques that continue to be used for decades to make the witches fly through the darkened skies and other fantastical landscapes. All these elements together produce an indelible mood that is both artistic and creepy, but in a way that differentiates it from the German Expressionist movement at the time was defined by Robert Wien's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Paul Wegener's The Gollum, How He Came Into the World, and F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu. The last section of the film focuses on mental illness, concluding that many who suffer from what the film calls hysteria would have been condemned as witches in the Middle Ages. 100% true. Those persecuted by the church in 1488 are persecuted by the law in 1922. Old age, ailment, disability, and mental illness were all seen as afflictions from the devil. Even today in some circles, they still are. The film goes so far as to argue that the institu uh, institu institutionalization of the mentally ill and the hydrotherapies popular at the time were akin to burning witches at the stake. The film ends with the image of a woman undergoing a tepid hydrotherapeutic shower, slowly fading to three bodies being consumed by flames. It is powerful imagery, though it is quite a stretch to compare the two. 
In reality, however, even today, mental illness along with old age, physical disabilities and disease are still met with fear and discrimination. This is, uh, though they are less often seen as afflictions from the devil, they're viewed by too many as afflictions of nature. This is truly a sad state of affairs. There have certainly been great strides in the past 100 years to improve this, but it's also clear that we have great further to yield to go. That argument is at the heart of Haxon. Yes. As the closing, closing titles implore us to consider, centuries have passed, and the almighty of medieval times no longer sits in his tense sphere. We no longer sit terrified in church, staring at frescoes of devils. The witch no longer flies away on her broom over the rooftops. But isn't superstition still rampant among us? Yet another century has passed since these words were first exhibited to audiences, and they remain as true as ever. This is clear in minor ways, such as many superstitions surrounding sports, daily horoscopes printed in newspapers, and posted online, and any number of innocuous fashions. But it also presents itself in more nefarious ways that are deep-seated in human nature and the pervasive fear of the other, surely a theme that has permeated the entire horror genre for more than a century of its existence. Films like Haxon confront us with the realities and demand that we examine ourselves. They are more than mere entertainments. They are calls to action. Just another way Haxon has proven its influence. And finally, the tendrils of Haxon reach through the ages. From F.W. Marnell's Faust, 1926, to Michael Reeves' Witchfinder General, 1968, from Ken Russell's The Devils, uh, and William Friedkin's The Exorcist, to Robert Eggers' The Witch, and Phil Tippett's Mad God, 2022. There is hardly a horror film with some kind of religious element, be it The Wicker Man, Conjuring, or even Om Omnibaba, or The Vigil, that does not in some way feel its influence. It is also one of the few silent films that does not feel dated in its subject, imagery, and performances. It is remarkably compelling now in its hundredth year, through its influence, less shocking as we see many of its transgressive elements crop up in various films through the years through the decades, but still it's called to throw off the shackles of superstition in whatever forms they take and treat our fellow humans with dignity and compassion is a message that is as true and potent now as it was 100 years ago. Just as Christensen in 1922, and we today look upon the events depicted in Haxon as horrifying, I have no doubt that future generations will look upon our modern superstitious practices, the various forms they take and the witch hurts uh, connected with them in their modern guises and shudder. Yeah, definitely. We are coming up on one hour, 19 minutes, and 30 seconds. Still got a few more left here to go. Yeah, these are all 100th anniversary uh, retrospectives that were published only in the past month. This is Matthew Mosley from uh, Collider, and uh, this is published October 11th, 2022. 100 years later, Haxon still has the power to shock and disturb. It's a strange experience watching a film from the silent era. Most were made before your grandparents were born, and virtually everyone involved in their production has been dead many decades over. The lack of recognizable names and use of archaic techniques gives them an otherworldly quality that no contemporary film can match. And modern audiences may view them less as films and more like relics unearthed from a lost civilization. The sense of detachment does lend itself to more objective analysis that only the passing of time allows for, but it also transforms them beyond their original form to create a wholly different beast. One of the greatest examples of this is Haxon a 1922 horror film by Benjamin Christensen that once held the record as the most expensive Scandinavian film ever made. Watching it today feels like rummaging through the pages of an ancient text where the dust of a bygone age still clings to the paper, elevating its already mysterious quality to new levels. You know, even before I read that, even before I read that, I thought to myself, you know what, watching Haxon is akin to like reading the Necronomicon from the Evil Dead movies. That's what I that's what I look at Haxon as being. 
That's what I really look hacks uh, at hacks as being. Brian Trash, great to see you, sir. Love this movie. Yep. Thank you. Uh, sounds awesome. Awesome. Hey, Dan. Uh, hey, Stone. Great pick tonight, man. Yeah, I, I thought this was the perfect pick. I honestly, well, this and Don't Torture a Duckling, which was wonderful as well. I did the commentary for that earlier, and it was terrific. But uh, for those watching, we are still watching Hacks, and we are coming up on one hour and 22 minutes, one hour and 22 minutes, and we have about 23 minutes left to go. So we're getting, we're winding down here. Yes, this is, uh, yeah, this is, of course, the 105-minute uh, long version of Haxon, the last restoration. The macabre nature of its being, one where witches and demons thrive and happiness is a luxury no one can afford, makes it a grim watch, exploration of superstitions and how blind faith and unproven truths can have dire consequences, makes it a compelling watch that offers far more than just cheap scares. A century on, its message remains relevant, painfully relevant. The most notable aspect of Haxon is its format, with Christensen issuing a traditional narrative structure in favor of a half-documentary, half-fiction framework. The film initially feels like an educational tool, with its opening taking the form of factual discussion about witches and their various betrayals through the centuries, while also establishing their longevity in the darkest corners of the human psyche. Following this, the film becomes a series of dramatized vignettes set during the Middle Ages, each depicting a different set side of the tragic period. And the final segment turns Haxon into a visual essay, with Christensen positing his theory that those accused of witchcraft were instead suffering from mental or neurological conditions that medicine did not yet understand, with their confessions coming solely from the threat of torture. It's an interesting way to structure a film, and it gives Haxon a unique quality that remains fresh a hundred years on. <clears throat> While not everything Christensen theorizes has aged well, medicine being the most constantly evolving form of science, of course, the brunt of what he's saying continues to ring true. Women have faced oppression throughout human existence, and the fear of witchcraft that spread through Europe from the 15th century onward was just one pit stop on the centuries-old road to perse persecution. A segment towards the end of Haxon illustrates this perfectly. A woman in the 1920s is shown with clear signs of hysteria, Coincidentally, the same signs those accused of witchcraft observed many, uh, observed many centuries prior. Instigated by her husband's death in World War I, her mother forces her to be examined, after which the doctor wastes no time saying she should be institutionalized. It's a clear improvement from 500 years ago when she would have been burned at the stake, but she's still being condemned to a miserable existence with little hope of recovery. As the film puts it, uh, he, we might like it to console ourselves that the lukewarm shower in the dismal psychiatric hospital has replaced the barbaric methods of old, but the end results are much the same as the powerful trans, uh, transition from the shower to women burning at the stake indicates. Superstition is a deadly force, and even after all this time, it still holds great influence. Mm -hmm. At core, Axon is a horror film, and Christensen is sure to include enough expressionist sequences to give the cabinet of Dr. Caligari a run for its money. Haxon is a phenomenal visual experience with foggy landscapes drenched in a thick layer of shadow, populated by soulless demons and grotesque devils persisting through the runtime. The artificial nature of the sets complements the heightened nature of the costumes and performances, giving these scenes a fantastical quality that is both mesmerizing and disturbing. Some of the greatest shots of the silent era are found here, with the image of two deformed pig-like creatures guarding a do doorway, while witches under the guise of cats desecrate a church altar, being a particular standout. Satan also makes a few appearances across the film, portrayed by none other than Christensen himself. His dual role is an overload in both the real and fictional world, cre creating a multitude of implications. He throws himself into the role with much gusto, and while his performance borders on the edge of absurdity, he succeeds in the straddling line between comedy and drama to become a true Truly unnerving presence. The world of Haxon is a strange place. It only makes sense that the person responsible for the madness is the strangest of the lot. <laughs> 
And see, we have a few others here. Yes, there's more. Yes, there's more. <laughs> the nuns. Uh, finally, I got one more here left to quote. I got one more. Oh, God, Christensen and his tongue. Oh, he's loving it. He's hot-dogging it. <laughs> Haxon. Uh, this is from uh, bfi.org.uk. Haxon, the silent era witchcraft film at 100. What witches do and what's done to suspected witches is given sensational treatment in Benjamin Christensen's 1922 silent film, Haxon. A century later, it's disturbing for even more reasons. Benjamin Christensen's Haxon is sort of a documentary. And it's the sort of that makes it unlike any other film. The Swedish silent melds historical fact and folk superstition to explore ideas about witchcraft from ancient times through the medieval period and on up to 1922 when the film was made. Unknowingly, Christian extended his examination 100 years into the future, as it's almost, as, as it's almost impossible to watch without making comparisons to the present time. Today's Haxon's horror lies less in its depictions of witches and witchcraft and more in the fact that it depicts hundreds of years of the ongoing systematic oppression and abuse of women. Upon its release, Haxton was instantly recognized as an unadulterated horror by a critic of variety who added that, quote, wonderful though this picture is, it is absolutely unfit for public exhibition, unquote. Haxton is still recognized as horror. It was included on the BFI's list of the 10 great silent horror films. And though its graphic depictions of nudity and blasphemy are less of a novel novelty to modern audiences, the images are still disturbing. Christensen condemns the practice of inquisitions while simultaneously filming the resulting torture with a sort of glee. The images of beautiful women stripped and strung up are still used in material meant to titillate. In Haxon, we see the atrocity of it, but we also see its allure. Haxon begins with a study of the ancient origins of witchcraft. The next part of Haxon features live action sequences presented as pseudo-historical reenactment of things witches were reported to do. And the, the film's worst atrocities come into play with the introduction of the Inquisition, as we see innocent women betrayed by other women who want to save their own skin. The scenes of a beggar woman being tortured are harsh by any decade's standards, and the extreme close-ups of her face and the agony it betrays our forerunner, forerunners of Carl Dreyer's The Passion of Joan of Arc, 1928, these close-ups were also cut by early censors, which is a sign of how great the acting is, that mere faces were deemed shocking as they betrayed the severity of the torture so explicitly. When the innocent Maria the Weaver is tortured and she can no longer stand, she admits to witchcraft, condemning herself to death as relief from her pain. Her confessions are worse than the original false charges. The sins she speaks are, of, are absurd because she is simply rattling off the worst things she can think of. Stomping on crosses, changing into a cat, and defecating on church altars, boiling infants alive. Maria names names, and a title card tells us that every condemned witch would give ten others away. At Haxon's close... We are told that women accused of witchcraft were often suffering from mental illness, and in this enlightened time of 1922, we can commit them to institutions instead and treat them with psychiatry. Christensen presents their difficulties and their modern treatment as a sort of gee whiz. Look how lucky we are today, Coda. With our present-day hindsight, this ending is as disturbing as the rest of the film because we know how women have historically been treated in institutions. Even worse is the assertion that instead of seeing the devil, women of the 1920s believe they are visited in the night by celebrities or even their own doctors. The film considers these fantasies concocted by disturbed minds, but today we know that women have sometimes been abused by doctors. The scene of the psycho psychologist coming into a terrified woman's bedroom at night is meant to show us that the woman is deranged, but the effect is chilling. The psychologist, perhaps unsurprisingly at this point, is also played by Benjamin Christensen. 
Haxon went on to heavily influence future filmmakers, most notably in films like The Passion of Joan of Arc, but his shock, shock waves also ripple through folk horror witch hunting films, such as Witchfinder General and Twins of Evil. The film's most powerful impact, though, is cultural. Each generation of women's experiences mingle with the history of female persecution and become a new extension of it. Haxon is ultimately not merely a witchcraft film and not fixed in time. It's a kind of living documentary, and we are all a part of it. All 100% true. All 100% true. Yes. We are coming up on one hour and 32 minutes. One hour and 32 minutes as we are about to close out Haxon. In closing, I should talk a bit about a few more of the actors in the film. Uh, Clara Ponto Padan, a uh, Danish actress. She worked in mainly Swedish and Danish silent films, including A Victim of the Mormons in Denmark in 1911. Uh, and she only made a few films. Doreen Gray's Portrait, 1910. Uh, the Miracle, 1913. The Clergyman, 1914. A, girl, girl, a Good Girl Keeps Herself in Good Order, 1914. Haxon. And her last film was in 1957, which was a Danish drama, called A Woman Not Wanted. And she plays... Um, she plays Sister Cecilia, the nun. That was Clara Ponto Padan. Uh, Oscar Stribble, who was the fat monk we saw earlier, born in 1872, died in 1927. Danish stage and film actor, worked prolifically under director Lau Loretzen, Senior, And he also made only a handful of films, including Kong Buxios in 1915 and Femalian Papil Psalm Spedge Dia in 1915, the English title being She Would Be a Scout. Uh, we also have um, Astrid Holm as Anna, the wife of Jesper the Printer. Astrid Holm was a Danish theater and film actress whose career began on the stage in, in the early silent film era. She was in films in 1917 to 1920, including The Film Carriage uh, and Haxon, both. <clears throat> and her last film was in 1947. And we also have Alice O'Fredericks, who played a nun, born in 1898, passed in 1968. Uh, and she, um, <clears throat> she is best known for directing the series of Far Till Fear comedies, father of four comedies, and the series of family dramas based on Morton Court's novels, having written 38 produced screenplays and directed 72 feature films, O'Fredericks was one of the most prolific directors in Danish cinema. O'Fredericks also directed the first Danish films which highlighted women's rights. The Alice Award, presented annually to the best female director at the Copenhagen International Film Festival, is named in Alice O'Fredericks' honor. And also in another role, uh, in another nun, was played by Gerda Madsen, uh, born 1902, passed 1986. Uh, another Danish film actress who was also in Kispus, 1956, Be Dear to Me, 1957, and some other films in the early 1960s. And she passed away in 1986 at the age of 84. The uh, part of the hysterical woman was played by Tora Tisch, was a Swedish theater and silent film actress. And she appeared in 10 films from 1920 to 1939, including The Lady of the Camellias and Eroticon in 1920. Paul Rumart is the jeweler, and he appeared in numerous films from 1910 to 1949. Uh, Haxon, as well as the 1922 adaptation of David Copperfield, uh, based on the novel by uh, Charles Dickens. And finally, we also have Albert Schmidt. Uh, from 19, 80, 1870 to 1945, was a Danish film actor, appeared in 13 films between 1911 and 1941. In addition to Haxon, he also appeared in Atlantis, 1913, Flight from the Millions, 1934, Sun Over Denmark, 1936. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, the film was uh, edited by Edla Hansen, a Danish film editor, actor from uh, active from the 1920s to the 1950s. And uh, this Haxon was one of the best known films that she edited. She grew up in Copenhagen and began working as a film cutter at Nordisk Film in 1915. She later spent time at the AS Palladium in Valby, and she was married to Holger Christian Hansen. We are one hour, 36 minutes, and 45 seconds. One hour, 36, 45 seconds as we come to a close here. Is there anything I missed about Benjamin Christensen? Um, hmm. I think I got everything. I got everything when it comes to Benjamin Christensen. Yeah. I quoted all five of the... Uh, 50th anniversary retrospectives. We got a little bit more of nudity here and hysteria. Everything that was basically said before. God, it's still shocking how much they got away with with this film. It really is. Anybody out there in the chat, please let me know what you think of Haxon because uh, we only got uh, roughly about eight minutes here. Yeah, just let me know what you think of Haxon. Did you enjoy this film tonight? I hope you all uh, found it different than the average horror film. And uh, that, I mean, the word unique has been brought up many, many times tonight. Uh, unique is probably the <laughs> uh, a word that you could see in every article when it comes to Haxon. Uh, highly uh, recommend you all pick up the Blu-ray, courtesy, <clears throat> courtesy of Criterion. Uh, I decided to... Uh, wait on getting the Criterion as I have uh, the Blu-ray, as I do have the Criterion channel. But like I said, you you can, you can have uh, outtakes and deleted scenes. You have the uh, introduction with Benjamin Christensen, and you also have the 1968 alternative version, Witchcraft Through the Ages. Uh, oh, and there's also an audio commentary. I, I did forget that there was also a commentary, which I was only able to listen to about 20 minutes of <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Yeah. But uh, the Blu-ray, you know, perfect stars on Blu-ray.com. Um New digital 2K restoration was undertaken by the Swedish Film Institute from a 35 millimeter duplicate negative. Images, including the intertitles, were tinted according to notes left by director Benjamin Christensen. The film looks remarkable in high definition. I projected it, and to me, the technical pre presentation is on par with what Alpha Omega Digital delivered for Ernest Lubitsch's The Loves of Pharaoh, which was also released in 1922. The density and the depth of the visuals convey is often breathtaking. Plus, the tinting is very nicely done. I agree. Also, you should be able to see from our screen captures that there are numerous ranges of fine nuances that emerge in the darker footage, which is something I always find rather remarkable to see on a silent film. There are no digital anomalies. Image stability is excellent as well. Fantastic restoration and very solid upgrade. Uh, the audio also has five stars as well. And like I said, among the extras, you have uh, information about the recent score that the film music specialist Julian Anderson recorded with the Czech Film Orchestra in Prague in June 2001. You have the 77-minute alternative Witchcraft Through the Ages version. You have a 15-minute program with film scholar Casper Tibjerg, focuses on some of the historical source that Benjamin Christensen uh, used while preparing Haxon. The program was produced by Criterion in 2011 with text descriptions in English. There's five minutes of footage, comes from a reel of test shots for various Benjamin Christensen films, which was collected by cinematographer Johan Angsterjern. And the commentary is by film scholar Casper Tipjerg, Recorded this audio commentary for DVD release of Haxon in 2011. And then there's also a 34 illustrated booklet, 34-page uh, illustrated booklet featuring an essay by critic Chris Fujiwara, remarks on the score by Julian Anderson, an essay by Chloe Germain Buckley, and technical credits. 
uh, definitely a must own. If you, if you love the uh, Criterion Collection, you know, uh, please support silent film. Please support silent film, please. Uh, because these movies are very, very important. And uh, um, I think Haxon should be in every horror fan's library. I really do think it should be. Uh, it's it's, it's mm -hmm. incredible film. The imagery is relentless. Absolutely, Eric. Absolutely. You na nailed it on the head right there. I love both movies you chose tonight for Halloween Stone. Thank you so much. Don't Torture a Duckling and Haxing are both fantastic films. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I absolutely agree. Although... Uh, I'm still leaning on Deathline for my favorite film, of, a horror film of 1972. I'm still leaning on that one. I mean, to Don't Torture a Duckling was close. It was very, very close. But I think I got to choose Deathline as my uh, favorite horror film of 1972 after all these 50th anniversary commentaries. But yeah, I, Haxon I had to do it. I, I just had to do it on Halloween night. I mean, it's the 100th anniversary. It's one of the most legendary of all silent horror films. It needed to be done. It needed to be done. But like I said, get the Blu-ray. Get it on physical media. Don't let it go out of print for real. Or don't wait until it's out of print, basically. <laughs> now, just to give everybody an idea as we are closing Haxon here, uh, I have just listed on my channel... Most of the commentaries that I plan on doing in November, and uh, you can you can see them all listed when you go to my channel uh, and everything. I'm only going to be doing about 11 commentaries in November. I'm going to be very, very busy next month. But uh, just to let everybody know, uh, on Sunday of next week, I will be doing Star 80 on November 6, uh, which is about the death of Playboy Playmate. Dorothy R. Stratton, uh, which was written and directed by Bob Fosse. This week, we will be doing a, a couple more 100th anniversary commentaries for uh, Harold Loy's Grandma's Boy, which is a comedy. And we will also do an action film, Alan Dwayne's Douglas Fairbanks and Robin Hood. And yes, the official title, which is registered and on screen, is Douglas Fairbanks in Robin Hood. We will be doing that Saturday night at 11 p.m. And uh, like I said, Sunday night is going to be Star 80. On uh, November 8th, which is Election Day, I will be doing Michael Ritchie's The Candidate, starring Robert Redford. Uh, on uh, Veterans Day, on uh, November 11th at 1 a.m., uh, I will be doing Francine Parker's FTA. Uh, looking forward to doing that. Saturday, November 12th, I'll be doing Jeremy Kagan's Heroes. Uh, November 13th, I'll be doing Sidney J. Fury's Pur Purple Hearts, starring Ken Wall and Cheryl Ladd. On November 19th, which is a Saturday night, I will be doing my favorite movie musical of all time, which is 1776, based on the Tony Award winning musical from 1969, about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And then on November 20th, Sunday, November 20th, will be James Bridges's Mike's Murder, starring Deborah Winger. And then finally on November 27th, which is also a Sunday, uh, I will finally be doing Philip Kaufman's The Right Stuff. I will finally be doing The Right Stuff uh, with uh, an amazing cast, one of the best films of 1983, one of the best Lad Company movies. And uh, the rest of the 1972 movies will be pretty much done in December. Uh, the I got some uh, I got some good ones lined up ready to go for December as well, but um, you know, and we'll close out 1972 with probably about 50 commentaries. <laughs> Never thought I'd get that get, get that many done, <laughs> but yeah, that is um, that was Haxon, uh, the witch, uh, the end, <laughs> slut, the end. <laughs> No, it's I, I don't I think it's slut. <laughs> slut the end. Uh, look, that just what what appeared on screen. Okay. <laughs> Happy Halloween to all of you. Thank you, Rob, Eric, Brian, Trash, Dan, Shine, and uh, uh, and Luke. You're all awesome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Happy Halloween to all of you. 
Hope you all enjoyed Hexen and you all 